I was expecting that you would be here. Um, my name is Jacob. I am presenting portions of uh, my master's thesis that I've been working on. The title of my project is Reading Streetlit with Incarcerated Juveniles. So, uh, from 2014 to 2016, I taught incarcerated juveniles in a county detention facility in Ohio. Uh, during my time there, I took on the responsibility of running the facility's library. And as the residents spend uh, much of their time in their cells, and reading was one of the few allowed activities, uh, almost all of the residents would read books. The necessity of reading to avoid boredom helped them form a reading community in, at the facility. Uh, the residents actively discussing the books they were reading, seeking recommendations from their peers and the teachers, and uh, sometimes reading as many uh, as eight books a week. There is a lot of very pr prolific readers there. Um, it, it really became an, an integral part of their incarceration experience. Uh, and in, in a previous unpublished study that I actually did with Kate, uh, we examined the residents' uh, motivations for reading and also the types of books that the residents prefer to read. One of the preferred types of books is what the residents commonly refer to as street books, um, a genre that uh, Academia uh, has labeled streetlit, amongst other things, but streetlit is the term that I use. Streetlit consistently depicts the gritty realism of people's experiences in impoverished urban environments and often addresses topics such as drugs, gang life, race, and violence. Uh, the paper I'm reading today uh, uses literary analysis and qualitative field research to explore how reading that genre of books uh, might affect how incarcerated juveniles understand their own incarceration and then also its reformative potential. For the sake of time, I'm only going to address two of my research questions. The first being, what kinds of representations of incarceration and reformation do the residents encounter in street-lit narratives? Uh, this question helped guide the literary analysis portion of my paper. And then my second question is, how do residents respond to those representations of incarceration and reformation? And that question helped guide uh, the, the analysis of my conversations with the uh, juveniles. Before getting into my findings, uh, I'd like to go through a bit of an explanation of my methods. My primary research was conducted during two visits to the detention center. I used a qualitative approach consisting of one-on-one -on -one preliminary interviews during the first visit and a focus group, or what I called a book chat, during the second visit um, with four of the residents. The preliminary interviews allowed me to get individualized responses from the facility's residents uh, to ascertain if they read or have read street-lit books. From their responses, then, I decided which books I should use for the subsequent book chat. Uh, the preliminary interviews were with uh, 13 residents at the facility. To recruit participants, I talked to each male resident at the facility and asked him if he would like to do an interview with me. All but one consented. Eight participants were white Caucasian, three were black African American, and two were mixed race, black African American, and white Caucasian. Uh, eight of the 13 participants reported that they read or had previously read Streetlit, and from their recommendations, I compiled a list of 19 uh, titles or series that, um, that they felt like I should read. Uh, from that list, I selected three. They are We Beat the Street by George Jenkins, Rebecca Hunt, Samson Davis, and Sharon Draper, The Gun by Paul Langan, and then Street God by Dimas Saladarios with Angela Hunt. Uh, prior to the book chat, uh, with some help from the department, funding from the department, I sent three copies of each of the three books to the facility uh, a couple of weeks before my second visit so that the books could circulate freely amongst residents uh, in the hopes that as many of them could read as many of the books as possible. I chose the book chat format because it enabled me to hear from uh, multiple residents at one time and also I felt encouraged the participants to share their thoughts on the books and their own life experiences with each other. Um, and the goal of that was to help create a richer, more in-depth conversation. Uh, when I got to the facility, I was informed that four of my previous students, um, who I will pseudonymously call Jackson, James, Katie, and Ken, uh, were currently residents there. Because I already had a rapport with them and felt like their familiarity would help me, uh, would help make them more comfortable with me, uh, and more willing to discuss their thoughts openly, I recruited them to, to be my participants for the book chat. Book chat lasted about two hours, during which I asked them to share their thoughts about the books we had read, and also how the books connected to their lives and their experiences of detention. For analyzing the book chat transcript, I looked for um, and examined two fundamental occurrences, the first being instances in which participants mentioned incarceration or revealed their attitudes towards it. 
And the second instance I look for, uh, which participants mentioned or alluded to personal change, whether it be a desire to change or uh, some sort of reluctance to change. Instances in which they mentioned incarceration or revealed their attitudes towards it help me better understand how the participants uh, perceived incarceration. And those instances also gave me an indication of how incarceration was impacting them, whether it be physically, mentally, emotionally, and or socially. And instances in which the participants mentioned or alluded to personal change help me identify if and why the participants were motivated to or even just believe they could change their behaviors and or lifestyles. Um, again, either to become a better person or just to avoid future incarceration. Drawing then on the most uh, salient elements of the book chat, I returned to the book and examined how those texts were depicting incarceration and reformation. I argue that two of the works, We Beat the Street and the Gun, perpetuate the myth of reformative incarceration and obscure overarching issues of systemic incarceration, poverty, and race. Uh, for the second time, I'm just going to give you uh, one or two examples. In We Beat the Street, one time in jail is enough for Samson and Rebecca, two of the protagonists, to want to become better people. Right away, they begin making changes to their lives in order to avoid uh, returning to jail, whereas many residents of detention centers, including some of the background characters in the book itself, uh, spend years of their lives going in and out of jail, trying unsuccessfully to overcome the influences of their environment and societal issues far beyond their personal control. By focusing on the ease with which those two characters, Samson and Remek, avoid recidivism and improve their socioeconomic standing, I feel like the books work to belittle people, those in the text or otherwise, who can't escape incarceration. Although it's not the author's intent to uh, make what Samson and Remek do, their accomplishments, make it seem easy, the book nevertheless uh, reduces the issue of escaping the penal system uh, in violent, impoverished environments to a matter of just working hard, making good decisions, and having the right role models. Next, I argue We Beat the Street and the Gun also present narratives that suggest that positive, supportive relationships are a key to personal reformation. Uh, in the book's introduction, Samson, George, and Rebecca collectively state, quote, individually, we probably would not have succeeded, but together, we were able to make it through high school, college, and medical school. They mentioned that they, quote, had to overcome obstacles such as poverty and apathy and violence, end quote, but they make no mention of their time in jail. Later in the introduction, the authors address their purpose in sharing their experiences with readers. Quote, in these pages, we want to show the power of friendship and of positive peer pressure. We also want to show the necessity for strong role models in the lives of young people. The three of us suffered because we didn't have many, and we hope to offer young people today three strong, positive role models they can depend on, end quote. From these excerpts, it is clear that the book's aim is to champion positive relationships and not to offer an in-depth exposition of prison life. Now, that's not necessarily the goal of all street life. Street life does not have to depict incarceration, um, but the fact that it focuses on uh, how impactful those relationships were and downplays the impact of incarceration on their life, I feel like um, avoids the, uh, the larger issues at play. With those then, those uh, representations of incarceration and reformation in mind, I returned um, to the book chat transcript to analyze how the participants then responded to the books. Uh, when encountered with depictions and narratives of reformative <coughs> incarceration, Jackson and Katie expressed skepticism. Uh, they allowed that jail can make a person want to change, but suggested that it rarely succeeds in doing so. When released from the detention center in the past, the participants went back to their old behaviors and were unable to avoid the pressures of their environment. Katie told me, quote, jail makes you want to be a better person. You're sitting in your cell thinking like, okay, I don't wanna be here. I want to change, I'm gonna change. And then you get out and it's so different. You're back to everything you were doing, end quote. Jackson agreed with Katie's sentiment that jail can make you want to change, but it's so easy to go back to the types of behaviors and activities that got them arrested in the first place. Jackson said, quote, but then, while you're doing what you're doing, you're thinking like, brah, I'm not trying to go back there. So you know, you're more slick about it, Katie finished for him. In contrast to the myth of reformative incarceration, the participants readily accepted the depiction of incarceration presented in Street God, uh, that being in jail can help teach you how to be a better criminal. Ken pointed out that Demas, the protagonist, had been, uh, had been to jail. Quote, he was smarter about his dealings and stuff like that smarter about who he associated with, end quote. 
And when asked if she thought detention had changed her, Katie responded, quote, no, I wouldn't say it changed me. It made me smarter on the streets not to get caught, end quote. The participants did not outright deny that being in jail can make you a better person, but in their collective experience, jail had had the opposite effect. Uh, the participants did, however, um, generally accept the idea presented in both We Beat the Street um, and The Gun that relationships can push you to become a better person and provided examples from their own lives of how their friends and loved ones encouraged them. Ken told the group, quote, I have a child. I have to change. Because at this point, I have so many people on the outs right now that are on my side rooting for me, depending on me to get out, that I don't have a choice but to get out and do good, end quote. Ken has been going in and out of various detention and rehab facilities for most of his life. But now that he has a son, he feels compelled to change his behaviors. Quote, being away from people hurts, he concluded. Kate immediately empathized with Ken's experience. Quote, being away from, you hurt, being away from them hurts you the most. Like me being away from the people, I have two people on the outs that really were depending on me. And I was helping out when I was out there. And now, like one of them doesn't have anywhere to go because she was living with me. And the other one doesn't really have anybody and depended on me emotionally, end quote. Like Ken, Katie admitted that being away from loved ones hurts the most and shared, quote, that's what makes me want to change, end quote. Although James and Jackson did not directly link relationships to a desire to undergo personal moral change, they indicated that being in jail has hurt them by disconnecting them from their loved ones. Overall, I found that the participants questioned the idea of reformative incarceration uh, and were motivated to stay out of jail to a greater or lesser extent by the desire to be with and look after the people we care about. In this paper, I make use of the phrase, the myth of reformative incarceration. By this, I mean the idea that harkens back to the birth of the penitentiary. The idea that the penitentiary should bring penance, uh, a redemption of the soul. I do not use the word myth for its modern connotation of something that is categorically untrue. Although the data on mass incarceration suggests that the idea of reformative incarceration is largely false, uh, stories such as Samson and Remex, which are nonfiction, prevent me from making such blanket statements. Instead of using myth to indicate something utterly untrue, I use it for its more classical meaning, a narrative meant to explain. Historically, myths were used to explain why things happened the way they did. Karen Armstrong, a religious historian, describes myths as, quote, stories that enable us to place our lives in a larger setting and give us a sense that against all the depressing and chaotic evidence to the contrary, life has meaning and value, end quote. She goes on to explain the effectiveness of a good myth. If it works, that is, if it forces us to change our minds and hearts, gives us new hope, and compels us to live more fully, it is a valid myth, end quote. Clearly, the books the residents read can uh, provide their personal narratives a place within literature, uh, a certain validation of their own experiences. Um, from this study, though, I conclude that the myth of reformative incarceration does not work. Not only is it often objectively untrue, but it has ceased to have that mythic significance for those who are incarcerated. The participants in the study did not think incarceration would help them bring about personal moral change, and being in jail certainly does not bring them hope nor does it compel them to live more fully. Originally, the penitentiary model, as Angela Davis elucidates, quote, was devised to provide convicts with the conditions for reflecting on their crimes and through penitence for reshaping their habits and even their souls, end quote. However, with, this, uh, with disheartening levels of incarceration and recidivism, it is clear that the justice system has lost sight of reformation as a goal. No longer does the myth of reformative incarceration serve to explain why so many people are locked up and stripped of their dignity. What the study does suggest instead is the validity of the myth of reformative relationships. Relationships may not be able to save the residents from incarceration or poverty, but they do bring them hope. It may be a false hope and that the relationships may further drag them down into destructive behaviors and even further cement them in a toxic environment. But the myth of reformative relationships can bring residents to hope to carry on. Armstrong notes that myths are guides. They tell us, quote, what we must do in order to live more richly, end quote. She also, in comparing the function of novels to that of myths, attests, attests that myths teach us, quote, to see the world differently. They show us how to look into our own hearts and to see our world from a perspective that goes beyond our own self-interest, end quote. My work with the residents at the detention center suggests that the residents 
do use the myth of performative relationships as a guide to live their lives more richly, to develop perspectives that transcend self-interest. Instead of wanting to get out of jail just so they can go back to having freedom and fun, they want to get out so they can support those who depend on them. The residents are motivated by their thoughts of friends and family. Relationships make them want to change so that they can be reunited with those they care about. Although the myth of performative relationships is not without its problems, it can give the residents the courage to make it one more day, despite having much of their humanity and their dignity deprived of them, to dream of a better future for themselves and their loved ones.